you. It's so wonderful to be here. And I've been so moved by all these incredibly courageous personal stories. Um, so now I want to tell one. Um, I married a Neanderthal. Uh, I only just found out. I went to this um, talk by Steve Churchill, who is the world's expert on Neanderthals. And he puts up a slide of a Neanderthal. And I'm sitting next to my husband, Brian, and I'm like, <laughs> I mean, he had everything. He had like the prognathic um, jaw. He had the heavy brow ridge. I mean, he even had like the barrel chest and the stubby little fingers. And I mean, the kicker was when he leaned over to me and said, because um, Steve had said how big the Neanderthal heads were. They were like 1,600 cubic centimeters. And um, Brian leaned over and said, I measured my head in college. It's 1,600 cubic centimeters. And I was like, so much is making sense to me now. <laughs> like, how is it? And you know, I've been married for 10 years and I never realized that I could fly a spaceship up your nose. I mean, your head is actually really quite big. Um, and so uh, <laughs> later, when Brian and I were trying to kill each other, I mean, this is something I know that all married people do at least once, but Brian and I are writing another book together, and so it happens all the time. And so um, we were in this throwdown fight, and when I realized, because I have this crazy imagination, and it turned into this like 3D like video game in my head where he was the Neanderthal and I was I was us. I was like the modern human, you know, skinny, flat face, like small head. And I realized I was not going to win. I mean, it was just the, it was just like physics. I and mean, we have lots of physicists in here and it's a size issue. And then I was wondering, it spun out into this larger question, how did we ever win? Like, how did we ever win? How did we ever beat a Neanderthal? And it wasn't just the Neanderthals. There were four other species of humans that were around when we were around. And, um, and you know, we weren't even doing that well. Like, we almost went extinct. <laughs> a couple of times. <laughs> and so, you know, the question that I deal with a lot is what is it that makes us human? And, but I think probably the real question is what makes us the human? You know, what makes us the human and why are we still around? So anyway, I want to talk about this guy um, who should have his own reality TV show, except for he's dead. But he's seriously, <laughs> like, he should be more famous than he is. He is a, well, he was a Russian geneticist at a time when it was a really bad idea to be a Russian geneticist. Um, you know, Stalin had decided that genetics was the enemy of the people and um, it was torn from textbooks, it was banned from the curriculum. I mean, I would have really liked 1930s Russia because genetics was my worst subject. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, then he also took the geneticists out and sent them to forced labor camps and shot them. And I think that was probably a little bit extreme. Um, <laughs> So it was under these conditions um, that Dmitry, his name was Dmitry Belayev, and he had this brother who he adored. It was his older brother, Nikolai. Um, he moved to Moscow and basically took care of Dmitry since he was um, in the second grade, about eight years old. So he kind of raised him. Uh, his older brother was a geneticist, so Dmitry wanted to be a geneticist. And then um, one day during one of Stalin's purges, they took um, Dmitry's older brother out and, and shot him without trial. So you can imagine that under these conditions and with this kind of personal story, how courageous Dimitri was to then conduct the greatest experiment in genetics in the 20th century. And what he did was he was really interested, um, like a lot of people have been all the way back since Darwin, on domesticated animals. Because domesticated animals, they have this really weird motley of traits um, all in common. So they have like floppy ears and they have curly tails and they have splotchy coats and then these changes to their behavior and sexual reproductive system and you know smaller teeth, smaller heads. And not all domesticated animals have exactly these traits, but they, I mean, these traits keep popping up. And the one thing they do have in common is that all of them are super friendly and much less aggressive than their wild cousins. And so the question was always like, well, how did they get this way? Like, you know, you can understand breeding like an animal for um, smaller teeth, but why would you breed them for a smaller head? And why would you want them to have like splotchy coats? And so Dimitri then decided, 
to do what nobody else has done before or since, and that he was going to domesticate an animal from scratch. Because, you know, we didn't have a time machine to go back and see what happened, take some notes as the first wolves were turning into dogs. Um, so he took this population of silver foxes and he selected them for one criteria, just one. He had this oven mitt, because um, these foxes were essentially wild. They would bite if you tried to hold them. So he had this oven mitt and he put it out to a fox. And if the fox approached, then he would keep them and breed them for another generation. And so in a really short amount of time, these foxes who were black, they were silver, the Russians used them um, for their coats, uh, started to look like this. They had floppy ears. They had smaller teeth. They had spotchy coats. If you, op if you opened you know, the door to their rooms, they would run up to you and, and wag their tails and bark and lick your face. So who does that sound like, right? <laughs> So just by selecting for one thing, one thing, whether or not they were friendly, Dimitri got all these other changes just by accident. So here's the thing about my Neanderthal husband. He worked with, um, he worked with dogs and he found out that they actually have a really strange increase in social intelligence. So if you like throw a ball and you know your dog doesn't know where it is, they will like look at you and you'll be like, it's that way. And then they will run off and they, you know, usually, usually, sometimes, will go and find the ball. And this is like seriously impressive because um, in order to do this, your dog has to understand that you know that they don't know where the ball is and that you're then trying to help them by giving them a gesture that they understand and it's like seriously meta, right? And um, so even our, our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, they can't do this. And so, you know, they have this really strange ability to, to read our body language in a way that no other animal does and this is extraordinary. So it turns out that these foxes that Dimitri had domesticated, they also have this ability. So basically, just by selecting for friendliness, not only do you get all these physical and behavioral and sexual changes, but actually you have an increase in intelligence. So let me introduce you to somebody else who should have their own reality TV show. Uh, bonobos. I said that our closest relatives were chimpanzees, but actually we have two closest living relatives, just like you have two uncles or two cousins. So all you need to know about bonobos is that they're just like people, except for super more awesome. So um, they are, females are in charge. Tanya would like that. Um, females are in charge. Uh, they don't kill each other and have sex all the time. Who can get better than that? <laughs> and so what we were interested in is, so say I give you $100. And there's somebody in the next room that you've never seen before and you won't see again. So, and you can choose to give this person some of your $100 or you can just choose to keep it. So economic theory predicts that we're just going to keep all the money because, you know, why would you give any of it away? But it turns out that across cultures and across, you know, genders and age, we tend to give as much as half. And so this was seen as something that was really uniquely human, um, you know, something called altruism. We do lots of these things. We donate to charity, we give blood, and, you know, we really hadn't seen it in any other animal. So let me show you this game with, um, with Saki here. All right, so this is Saki. I've just given her the same, um, the same choice. Uh, her $100 is that uh, she hasn't had any breakfast, so she's a good big pile of fruit salad. Aliki is next door. She doesn't really know him. Is she going to share or is she going to keep it all? So she opens the door, she lets in a leaky and shares her food. And that's just to show you that they, they like playing these games and it's fun. This is like a sanctuary. They go out and play in a really big forest afterwards. So it turns out that not only do bonobos like to share, but they love to share. And if I rephrase that game to you, and if there was somebody, that if you have the choice between sharing that $100 with a stranger or with you know, one of your really good friends, is that most of us would prefer to share with our friends or, or family members. It, bonobos don't. They would prefer to share with strangers. Um, they will, you know, they'll be, their friend will be next door going, hey, come on, we're buddies, let me in. And the bonobo will go and be like, no, there's this stranger here, they look really just here, come and eat my food. Anyway, so um, what we also found in bonobos was they have a really, they have an increase in social 
intelligence. So we gave them this um, cooperative game where uh, you have to cooperate with another bonobo to, to get the food. You could only do it by cooperating. And it turns out that bonobos are better than chimpanzees at this, cooperating uh, at this cooperative game, even though the chimpanzees that we tested were already experts in this game. And they'd been playing it for months, and the bonobos saw it for the first time, and it was like, just boom. So because of their increased friendliness and tolerance, and this is the thing about bonobos, is that they are incredibly tolerant of each other. I mean, not only do they prefer to share with strangers, but um, this sort of, uh, this friendliness and this lack of aggression has allowed them to overcome one of nature's laws. And that is, if you are bigger and stronger than somebody else, then you are dominant. So there was this um, bonobo that I loved at the sanctuary that you just saw called Mimi. And she was like, you know, your little grandmother. She was all wrinkled and, you know, kind of like a little bit haggish. But she was in charge, right? And um, the other, one of the bonobos there, Tatanga, he was like the big male. And, you know, he decided that he was, he was, he was like a third bigger than she was. And he was just done with this bonobo lifestyle. And he was going to, he was going to chimpanzee it up, right? So one day he just went across to her and just, backhanded her across the face as hard as he could. And, like the whole sanctuary went quiet. And you know, she took it like a champ. Like he, she was so hard, she got whiplash. Then she just turned around. She looked at him and he just started to run because <laughs> he knew that five of her friends would be after him and they were within seconds and they chased him all around the night building and into the forest. And when he kept acting like a chimpanzee, um, they beat him up so badly he almost lost his testicles. So this is not to say that bonobos could not be violent, but they just use violence uh, to uh, maintain peace and order and not to dominate. So what does all this mean? So we usually think of um, us as domesticating other species. So back to this question that domestication was something that we did. But what probably happened was this. So two wolves walk into a bar. I'm just joking, I'm not going to tell any bar jokes. Um, so two wolves walk up to a village, and one of them says, do you smell something? And the other wolf says, not me. And the first wolf says, it smells like poop. It smells delicious. So lots of people have had this idea, but I actually came up with this idea myself, because when I was potty training um, my daughter, Malu, we just used to leave her pants off and leave like potties all over the house. And it was, was not the most genius idea, but it was all I could come up with. I was so sleep deprived. Um, and so we had, so our dog, uh, like we had this case of the disappearing poop. Like she'd come up to me and go, mommy, I did a doo-doo. And I would be like, great, which one? And she, you know, she was like, two, she's like, so I would go around to all the potties to try and find, you know, the doo and they were all clean all of them and this went on for weeks and I'm like what's happening is she going outside is she going to explode and then I noticed that every time she left the room like this our dog Tazzy would follow her and then come back with a really smug look on his face <laughs> so I mean, what probably happened is that, you know, the first wolves hanging around human campsites figured out that we make a lot of trash and other things that are nutritious. But we hate large carnivores. I mean, when we arrived in Europe, we wiped out almost all of them, um, except for wolves. And so if wolves were aggressive towards people, I mean, and they were larger than they are today, we just would have killed them. So only the super friendly wolves would have survived. And what we learned from the foxes is that when you select for friendliness, an extreme pressure for, for friendliness, then you get all these other changes that happen by accident. So these wolves would have started to look very quickly, very different to the other wolves. They would have gotten floppy ears and splotchy coats and curly tails. Um, so we would have been able to, to see them. And not only that, is that they would have had an increase in social intelligence. So they would have been able to, you know, like read our body language and our intentions. And so, that makes them all of a sudden not a fanged carnivore. That makes them like a really valuable social partner. So the wolves, we didn't domesticate dogs, they domesticated themselves. 
And so if this could happen in dogs, then probably this could happen in bonobos because we didn't domesticate bonobos. They live in a giant jungle. And if we didn't domestic, and you know, if it could happen in bonobos, and let me take you back like 50,000 years ago, something really extraordinary happened to us. We had this um, explosion of technology. We got pyrotechnology, watercrafts, like all these tools. Like, you know, we had this Acheulean hand axe for like a million years. And then all of a sudden we had all this other stuff. And everybody always assumes it was because we got smarter. But what, at the same time, or just before this started to happen, we also started to live in really large social groups. So we had to become much more tolerant of one another. And if we had then this extreme pressure against to, to be friendly and tolerant, then maybe all this other stuff, being really skinny, the small hands, the small teeth, um, would have happened by accident, including this increase in social intelligence that it allowed for all this technology. So when we're thinking about the problems and the challenges that we face, the human paradox is that if we see someone as being like us, as being um, you know, the same race, religion, sports team, in social class, whatever arbitrary boundary we define, then we are the most cooperative species on Earth. But if we see someone as being different from us, then we're the cruelest species on Earth. And the challenge for us is that we need to learn how to be more bonobo, to how to understand how to see everyone as being like ourselves. Because the problems that we face uh, and the challenges for the future are not questions of intelligence and technology. They're questions of tolerance. So the thought that I want to leave you with is that, um, you know, be more bonobo. Because as the Neanderthals found out, it's not the survival of the fittest out there. It's survival of the friendliness. Thank you.